Um, I want to thank you um, all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, um, those that uh, follow us from Europe. And also, I want to have to say good morning to, to Professor Yanidis, who is with us from uh, California. And I want to thank him for making the time. So it's uh, Eva Kaili, um, the chair of the Future and uh, Science uh, of Technology. I want also to thank uh, the Bureau that uh, made this possible, this meeting under these circumstances. It's not easy because um, we cannot use any application. We have to make sure it's protected and uh, it's um, also accepted by the European Parliament. Um, so this will be one of the first events in, uh, a of a series of events for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, we will try also to connect it with the Center for Artificial Intelligence in order to see how new technologies and science can, can help us um, deal with, um, with the pandemic, but also with the um, impact it might have and also the opportunities it could uh, create. So I would like to thank you again uh, for being with us and sharing your expertise. Um, I am personally very interested, but uh, we received a lot of uh, similar requests from many uh, members of the European Parliament to have a discussion um, on COVID with scientists. And um, uh, since this is a, basically a public health emergency that seems to change and transform our world in a very dramatic way, um, we have a huge challenge also as, uh, as politicians, but you also as uh, scientists, uh, researchers, the, all the workers in the healthcare system, uh, epidemiologists and uh, law enforcers. So uh, hopefully today we will manage to understand a bit more and you can help us to, um, to see if we are dealing with this crisis in a proper way in order to contain it, but to effectively han handle it and also some light in uh, to understand how it can be transmitted because still it's it's not very clear also to to my government in Greece for example or how the um release of some measures will uh, be able to take place and what is the strategy for the day after and if the travel bans uh, were the best solution and should they continue or not um do we have strategies based on, on uh, the right data and most importantly, what you believe is the timeline um, for an effective, effective treatment. I don't even talk about vaccine because I, I understand it would take a couple of years, but the treatment would be uh, really important so that citizens will feel again confident to, uh, to get back to, to their normal lives and behaviors. Um, so this pandemic uh, requires also uh, all of us to make rapid decisions. Um, under scientific uncertainty. So if you have this equation where you have to collect data and make decisions and find solutions, there is a series of uncertainties and metrics that we cannot uh, identify yet without uh, um, your expertise. And also we have to shape our responses on the basis of best practices and uh, this sharing of, of data and a having a constant dialogue with, uh, with scientists. So uh, hopefully this discussion will uh, uh, shed some more light uh, to this complex topic and um, I don't want to make it political so I would uh, love to give first the floor to our uh, excellent uh, participants and speakers about uh, how to um, to have credible scientific evidence and when and their timeline and uh, their advice and uh, as I said um, I would like to extend a special thanks to our scientific foresight unit for organizing it under these extraordinary uh, circumstances. So first I will present um, Professor John Ioannidis from Stanford University. For the ones that haven't read his CV I will just mention a couple of, of uh, uh, important um, notes on his CV uh, because the, the big organizations that are at this point feeding us with data on, on the outcome it's the World Health Organization, is the Johns Hopkins and European Center for Prevention and uh, Monitoring of, of Diseases. So I think it's very important to also see um, the perspective of, of big universities and academia. So he's a, a chair of disease prevention and uh, a professor of medicine, epidemiology and population health, and also biomedical data science and statistics. Um, he has uh, at the center uh, of innovation in Stanford. 
Um, he has uh, also been uh, um, inducted in the Association of American Physicians. And uh, I, I can say that he's participating to the American Epidemiological Society. So I think uh, he's the right person um, to start this uh, uh, debate with. And uh, please, I would like to give you the floor and then I will present the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind invitation. It's a great honor to participate in this event and to share some thoughts. Uh, is it possible to share my slides uh, so that they would be visible on the screen? We already we shared your your uh, your slides with all the okay. MEPs. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, this is clearly one of the most serious problems that we have faced as a society, both in Europe and uh, the U.S. and around the world. Um, and uh, we had to act very fast, uh, uh, very often with very draconian measures, uh, to try to do our best based on the early data that we have. In uh, the last month, we have collected information that uh, gives some ray of hope and uh, some prospects for some uh, better outcomes down the road. Uh, next slide, please. Next one. So what we have learned uh, uh, recently is that apparently uh, COVID-19 is a very common infection. Uh, we have now several seroprevalence studies in different locations in California, in Robio, in Tangos, in Telluride. We have blood donor studies in Netherlands and Denmark, uh, homeless shelter studies, uh, universal PCR screening for delivering women in uh, New York City that was published in New Journal Medicine, and uh, widespread infection documentation in air carriers that goes entirely unnoticed uh, until many, many uh, people are infected. Um, contrary to the original impression where uh, we thought that uh, based on the Wuhan uh, data, 3.4% uh, of people who are infected die, and the uh, first impression was that there were not that many asymptomatic people. It seems far more likely now, and of course all of that evidence needs to be vetted and uh, combined and uh, thoroughly peer-reviewed, but the, the most uh, reasonable picture is that we're dealing with vast proportions of infections. Um, most of them are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, they remain unnoticed and untested. Uh, the testing that we have done uh, has uh, picked up, but still we miss uh, probably the vast majority of infections. So there's a correction factor in the denominator that could vary from 20, 50, uh, sometimes 100 or, or more in different locations, depending on the uh, number of tests that they have been doing. Next slide, please. Uh, that's another thing that uh, uh, we have learned is that uh, this is an infection that has a tremendous gradient of risk. Uh, many people have ex extremely low risk and many others uh, have uh, devastating or very high level of risk. Uh, this is some data from different locations in Europe and the U.S. for the risk of death in people less than 65 versus more than 65. In uh, European countries, the difference uh, in risk is uh, between 34 and 75 falls, so it's, it's a tremendous risk gradient, um, meaning that uh, uh, the younger people have uh, very, very low risk, uh, and older people, as they you know, go up the scale, they can have uh, substantial risk, especially when we reach uh, uh, very elderly populations. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some data also looking at the proportion of deaths accounted by people less than 40 years old, uh, we see in the news very often stories about uh, uh, very young people with uh, severe disease and, and dying. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, very interesting for, for media, but uh, the truth is that uh, it's far less than 1% of the deaths that occur in people less than 40 years old, uh, even though uh, they represent about half of uh, the, the population uh, in, the, in the general population. Next slide, please. Even among those, the, the vast majority have some serious problems and underlying conditions. The proportion of deaths in people less than 65 who have no underlying conditions, no severe uh, disease, uh, is, as I show in this slide, 0.3% uh, in the Netherlands, 0.7% in Italy, and 0.7% in New York. So it's, it's a very small number, and one needs to take into account that uh, uh, among us, there's many who may have a serious condition that has not been diagnosed. Uh, you know, we, we don't really get body scans for everything every day to make sure that uh, we have fixed the cancer that has been growing or, or uh, ischemic heart disease that uh, uh, is uh, dormant but, but is still potentially active. So the, the data suggests an extremely steep gradient uh, of risk, 
And the vast majority of people really don't have any much risk. Uh, the vast majority of people actually probably have a risk of dying during the coronavirus season, but it's in the same range as the risk of uh, dying while they drive from home to work, uh, you know, with, with their car or, or being hit by a car while they try to get to work uh, by bike or, uh, or walking. Next slide, please. Conversely, there are some locations that are tremendously hit. Uh, and uh, as the full picture is evolving, we realize that uh, there's a very large proportion of deaths that are happening in home care and nursing homes. Uh, data from European countries like Italy, Spain, France, Ireland, and Belgium show that uh, maybe between 42 and 57 percent of COVID-19 deaths occur in care homes. Some countries are better in tracking these deaths than others. I think that uh, many are, have started adding these deaths in, in the total count, but it's a very large proportion. In, in New York City, there are about 25 percent, 20 percent or higher in many locations across the U.S., and this is a picture that is still evolving. When COVID-19 hits, uh, elderly people in home care, in nursing homes, it, it can be devastating. And as we said before, it is asymptomatic. So lots of uh, care staff can really get to, to these uh, uh, care homes and uh, nobody notices until it's too late unless testing is done. Next slide, please. In the same way, we have a major problem with nosocomial infection. We have uh, lots of evidence, uh, even an early report from Wuhan showed that uh, in, in a series of 138 patients that they were hospitalizing with COVID-19 uh, pneumonia, 41% were either medical personnel or hospital-acquired infection hospitalized patients. As of April 22, uh, there's about uh, 18.5 thousand infected medical personnel in Italy, and not everyone is tested, so the real number may be even double or you know, substantially higher. In the UK, uh, again, the data are not very mature, but it could be that in the recent infections uh, in the mid April and beyond, up to 30% are somehow related to healthcare workers. And again, we need to have the full picture. What this means that, is that uh, the, the worst thing that can happen is to get that virus to the hospital, infect personnel, contaminate uh, the hospital, then have patients who are very sick by being in the hospital, being infected. You have nosocomial infection, you have very high infection fatality rates, and the worst thing that you can do is tell people to come to the hospital if they have symptoms of COVID-19, unless they have very severe symptoms. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So what does this mean? It means that we need to test periodically all personnel in hospitals and nursing homes, because this is really where much of the battle and many of the deaths are happening. We need to have draconian infection control and hygienic measures in hospitals and nursing homes. This infection is largely asymptomatic. If we just wait to see symptoms uh, for, for people to tell them to go home, that's not going to work. We need to guide the next steps to gradually remove lockdown measures because they can have tremendous consequences for our society, for our economy, for health, for deaths eventually because uh, of, of the meltdown of, uh, of, our, of uh, our fabric. Uh, with continuous epidemiological surveillance. We need seroprevalence to know how many people are infected. We need incidents to see how many new cases uh, are active. We need uh, hospital bed capacity assessments, all of that happening at the same time to tell us what we can start removing from the lockdown measures. Uh, what does that do and uh, uh, are we moving in the right direction? We should avoid confronting the virus when it strikes hard and achieves high test fatality rates. So keep it away from the hospitals, keep it away from nursing homes, keep it away from debilitated people. We need to do that very quickly. The horizon for vaccine, as everybody understands, is very long term probably, you know, one or two years and it's even uncertain. Treatment, there's more than 500 treatments, uh, treatment studies being done at the moment. One can be optimistic that something will work, but I wouldn't take it for granted. Uh, there is uncertainty about it. We just need to have the best studies we have a number of uncontrolled studies that should be taken with a grain of salt and, and with very great caution because for an asymptomatic infection where almost everyone does well with these dire exceptions, just depending on uncontrolled, non-randomized studies is uh, uh, just a recipe for disaster. So I, I will stop here and uh, thank you again for the kind invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you gave us a lot of uh, actually data and you cleared the noise and uh, I'm, I'm ready for questions, but I would like to hear first all the speakers we have. 
So I will move immediately to Dr. Andrea Mon from the, the director of our European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. I know she has to leave, so I'm sorry I didn't give you first the floor, I was just informed. And um, your uh, expertise can help us a lot on how to deal with it, because in Europe we also have to coordinate better. So it's really important to, to listen to you and see how you can um, give us your experience from and, and your expertise and also your directions and advice. So the floor is yours, doctor. Thank you. You, you have to open the mic. And we will close ours so that we uh, make it more easy for, uh, for our connections. Just press one on your screen and then you will see the mic and press on the mic. Not yet. You, you have to see the mic on your screen. It's somewhere. And just press on that. We don't hear you. We cannot hear you yet. <clears throat> Do you see your mic on your settings? No. Can you press Control and M because um, this could actually work? Control M the same time. Can you see your settings on, on top of your screen? And don't you see a little mic, um, a small icon? You have to press on that or on your keyboard, control and the letter M. No. Nope. No? Do you want to try to reconnect from the beginning? Maybe we can uh, wait for you for a couple of minutes. I think maybe the host can also unmute her. You think? I, I tried. I mean, if you can mute and unmute everyone. No, I will try to or it might be a technical problem yes if you if Zolt could um find the participant list then maybe he can try unfortunately um, when i wanted to give the role of a speaker accidentally i tapped on organizer so Mrs. Amon should give back me the role of organ host by clicking on my name. Okay. Why don't you call her, Zolt, um, and we we move to uh, Professor Paolo uh, yes, Vines from that, Imperial College, and then the moment you yes. In okay. any case, we have short intervention. I think we're going to make it. Thank you. So, Professor Paolo Vines, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am. Thank uh, you for I'm being with to... us. Sorry. And we you. can hear you, basically. I just wanted to, to say a couple of things about you, that you're chairing the environmental epidemiology at Imperial College, and you actually, uh, you're famous for modeling protocols and ways to respond to um, to similar pandemics and, and viruses. So it would be uh, extremely important to uh, to listen to you. And since you are also head of the unit of genetic and molecular epidemiology at the Italian Institute for Genomic Medicine in Torino, maybe you could also share some uh, information on how it went so bad in Italy and uh, how can we um, learn from that and how we can move faster with our response. Right. Uh, I'm trying to uh, share my slides. I hope I, I'm able, yeah. 
Okay, can, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my presentation is uh, um, pretty practical, uh, and it is about uh, the, the uh, transition to the second phase, to the so-called uh, uh, second phase, because, uh, as you know, in Italy, we are in a situation where uh, we are seeing yeah. uh, the, the light at the end of the uh, tunnel as far as... Uh, uh, phase one is confirmed. Uh, so we, th there is much discussion about uh, the second phase, uh, which means a relaxation of the containment uh, uh, measures. Can you please uh, change the slide? So, uh, can you change the slide? Okay, oh, I, can yes, yes. I, I can do it. Thank yes. you. Uh, all Thank right. You. So, um, there are several uh, documents uh, we can refer to uh, for the adjustment uh, of uh, public health measures uh, um, uh, in, in transition into the second phase. Uh, for example, this uh, excellent WHO uh, document of April 16, uh, where they first of all uh, describe three uh, scenarios uh, for, for what is coming uh, in the next uh, uh, weeks or months. Um, a complete interruption of uh, human to human transmission, which is uh, uh, totally unlikely, uh, recurring epidemic waves, uh, large or small, and continuous uh, uh, low level transmission. Uh, their opinion is that, uh, based on current evidence, the most plausible scenario involves uh, recurring epidemic waves uh, interspersed with periods of low level transmission. Now, um, I will talk a little bit about Italy as well. Um, where I'm involved uh, at the governmental level because I'm, I'm a member of a task force and also at the regional level where I give advice to the, the regional administration um, about these uh, uh, practical issues of uh, uh, moving to, to the second phase. Um, another um, good document uh, is from the National Enterprise Institute in the United States, uh, which is a, a, a roadmap to reopening. Uh, we're talking about a potential reopening. In fact, uh, the Italian government has set uh, May the 4th uh, as uh, a date uh, to start uh, reopening, uh, which will be gradual reopening, ob obviously not uh, sudden reopening. So uh, what are the uh, prerequisites? Uh, uh, well, this is uh, uh, consistent uh, with other documents uh, like the WHO. Uh, briefly, uh, one uh, should see a, a, a sustained reduction of cases for at least uh, 14 days. Uh, hospitals, uh, it says in the state because it refers to state action in the United States, but uh, it is a, a general message. Uh, hospitals in regions, I would say, in, in Italy, are safely able to treat all patients uh, uh, without resorting to uh, crisis standards of care. Then the state should be able to test all people with uh, symptoms. Uh, and I, I would add uh, all uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, subjects in certain uh, high risk populations like uh, nursing homes uh, and uh, the, the hospital personnel. Uh, and then, uh, and this is quite important, uh, the, the state should be able to conduct uh, active monitoring of confirmed cases uh, and their contacts. And this uh, um, case identification and contact tracing is really crucial in the second phase, uh, and it is probably the most uh, difficult uh, uh, intervention uh, from the organizational point of view. So, um, well, you mentioned uh, modeling in, uh, at Imperial College. In fact, uh, um, uh, I'm not uh, directly involved in modeling because I, I'm a cancer epidemiologist and uh, an environmental epidemiologist, but I'm in direct contact with people doing modeling uh, like Neil Ferguson and, and others. So, the, um, uh, at Imperial College, uh, people have done several things uh, that I'm showing in the next uh, slides. Um, <clears throat> essentially, they have tried to model the impact uh, of uh, relaxing different measures of containment. Uh, uh, in terms of number of deaths uh, and uh, bed uh, occupancy that each policy would imply. So, for example, would what uh, would... Uh, numbers uh, at uh, this stage, if we have obviously... Who is talking? 
Um, okay, um, what would imply, for example, uh, reopening the schools uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a new wave of epidemic uh, or new outbreaks uh, uh, in terms of number of deaths uh, and number of beds occupancies? This is one way to uh, address uh, the problem. And I show you a few estimates later. Um, in general, uh, it seems that we need a trade-off. It's, it's really a problem of trade-off between uh, the health impacts of, of the virus uh, and the socioeconomic impacts, uh, including the health uh, impacts related to uh, the economic crisis induced by, by the epidemic. Uh, um, so the uh, relaxation of uh, containment measures uh, imply this kind of trade-off. Um, the main strategy is uh, still based, uh, uh, obviously, on hygiene uh, measures, um, uh, uh, but also uh, test, uh, trace, and isolate, uh, with a particular emphasis on high-risk uh, and fragile subjects, uh, nursing homes, uh, and uh, the um, hospital population. This has a very um, important uh, uh, organizational uh, implication. As I said, I work for the regional administration, and uh, um, Italy uh, lacks uh, in certain regions uh, a, uh, a solid, sound uh, uh, public health network, a network of public health uh, professionals uh, that was, in a way, dismantled uh, in the last uh, 15 years. And this explains uh, the, the differences uh, um, among regions in Italy. Uh, your question was about uh, the, the very high rates uh, um, of uh, uh, infection and mortality in Lombardy. And uh, one of the main explanations is that they mainly use the hospitals to address the epidemic. Uh, and hospitals were a, a, a vehicle for the transmission of the epidemic. Whereas uh, the, the, the uh, regions that uh, um, had a, a lower impact of the, of the epidemic, like uh, uh, Emilia or Toscana um, ha, or, or Veneto, uh, have uh, a, a sound uh, public health uh, uh, network, and also they use uh, um, general practitioners extensively uh, for early detection of the cases, uh, 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 contact uh, um, uh, tracing, and isolation. Um, concerning uh, immunological or serological tests uh, that uh, were, were mentioned by John, uh, this is an additional uh, tool that, that can be used and will be used uh, with many caveats because uh, uh, several tests are still inaccurate. So essentially what we are saying is that they are useful for uh, seroprevalence studies uh, in the population um, to know uh, what is the prevalence of the infection uh, they cannot be used at the individual level, for example, to um, identify workers uh, who can go back uh, to, to work, because uh, we don't know much about uh, the protection that uh, uh, such tests uh, confer. Uh, not all, all of the tests uh, are neutralizing, particularly the, the commercial kits. So they, they do not detect uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. Um, so I, I was saying that uh, the group by Neil Ferguson uh, is uh, providing estimates, uh, uh, now also specific by countries, uh, for Italy, for example, where they um, estimate uh, the impact of different, uh, uh, of the re relaxation of specific uh, containment uh, measures. So for example, for Italy, they estimated that uh, um, an uh, R0 around uh, one uh, was reached uh, uh, on May the 11th, but this has not been confirmed by others. They also estimated that uh, um, the um, lockdown measures uh, put in place by the government uh, allowed uh, Italy to avoid uh, about uh, 38,000 deaths, which with a broad uh, uh, credibility interval. Uh, so, uh, as I said, said before, uh, what they are trying to do now is to uh, estimate the impact of uh, relaxing or um, uh, lifting one measure uh, at a time. Reopening schools, uh, uh, re um, decreasing the um, social distancing, and, and so on. Final slide. Uh, um, I think that uh, 
nowadays in the situation we have in Italy, uh, which is pretty fragmented uh, uh, in terms of uh, regions, uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, um, the, um, the, the situation implies uh, a very strong uh, interaction between uh, several components, which is uh, to create an integrated informational system, putting together information from different sources, including the apps. Uh, um, we can talk about apps if you're interested later. Uh, then uh, mathematical modeling, like the one I mentioned, uh, and uh, really crucial is the uh, having a sound network of public health professionals uh, for a safe transition to phase two and through. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, very much. It was, uh, I admit, very interesting. I have to go. If, if we have Dr. Andrea Mon immediately to her because he had to leave, uh, can we connect now? Can we listen to you? Okay, can you hear me now? Ah, perfect. Ah, yes, uh, uh, yes, doctor, thank you. I have already presented you. would love to, to give you the floor and listen to you. Okay, so uh, sorry for the, the hitch, um, but um, uh, I would like, I have to, I don't have slides, and I would like uh, to give basically some input on two uh, uh, aspects. One is how we keep track of uh, the uh, uh, pandemic at European level and what we learn from the data that uh, we collect. And second, uh, how we um, uh, advise uh, for, for now for this uh, roadmap uh, for exit that uh, the Commission has recently published. So surveillance is of communicable diseases is our core responsibility. Um, and um, we collect data on nearly 60 diseases um, um, uh, at the frequency that is uh, determined by the intended use of surveillance data. In addition, we carry out event-based surveillance, which relies on proactively searching worldwide for events that may pose a threat to citizens of the uh, EU and the UK. Now, when um, uh, uh, this uh, COVID outbreak now started, um, we rapidly realized that the importance of relying uh, um, uh, on multiple surveillance systems and data sources is, 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 is crucial in order to address the mass massive information requirements from member states and the EU institutions. And that is intrinsic to any pandemic where a new virus or uh, uh, with an easily Transmit, that's easily transmissible from person to person is introduced in a population that is entirely susceptible. So we use the event-based surveillance. We use reporting from member states of detailed information on all cases in our surveillance system called TESI. And we are promoting population-based surveillance to more accurately estimate also incidents, trends, and the impact of interventions through primary, secondary care and mortality data. We are also encouraging countries to implement participative uh, surveillance systems, engaging citizens through mobile apps, online questionnaires, hotlines and other ways. So what do we see here? We have now uh, today a bit more than one million cases uh, reported in the EU and 840,000 of them uh, are in our database already, which is, I mean, the result of a massive, huge effort that our member states are doing. And almost half of them are in a case-based format. So um, we see that uh, overall, 42% uh, are actually hospitalized. 2% have severe illness. And the overall crude fatal, uh, case fatality is 10.5%. Now, when we look only at the hospitalized cases, so there the crude uh, fatal, case fatality is 14%, and 7% of these hospitalized cases actually are in intensive care. The hospitalization rates increase remarkably when uh, from, from 60 years onwards. And the increase in mortality is more pronounced from 70 onwards. And um, between 9 and 26% uh, of the cases are healthcare workers. 
So uh, we also can look um, uh, at the course of the disease and the time it takes, for instance, from the onset of symptoms to hospitalization, which is around six days. From the onset of symptoms to death is around 11 days. From hospitalization to death, it's around seven to eight days. And from hospital admission to the need for uh, intensive care admission, around three days. And these data can really inform real-time planning of hospital capacity based on surveillance data. Now, um, what we see as uh, the result of all the measures that countries have implemented is that the 14-day incidence in the EU has overall declined by 18% since the 8th of April. And in 20 of the EU countries, it appears that the initial wave of transmission has already passed its peak. Now, nonetheless, we would uh, uh, suggest that caution is still needed to be exercised when starting to lift some of the measures. And we have several considerations that need to be um, uh, taken into account. First is prior to modifying measures, each country need to have an appropriate and adequate testing uh, of COVID-19 as well as rigorous contact tracing implemented that is capable of detecting and closely monitoring changes in disease transmission over time um, and within and between communities. So, and it should be all suspected cases that be included in this monitoring system and all cases or a proportion of them um, uh, should be tested for, for uh, COVID-19. Now, because in absence of reliable and representative data from surveillance systems, it will be difficult for countries to decide when it is possible for certain measures to be adjusted or readjusted uh, because uh, of the surge of, um, of, of cases. Now, we also recommend that um, epidemiological indicators that should be monitored during um, uh, the, the lifting of, of measures um, should be started uh, mon uh, to be monitored before the change in order to have a baseline where you deviate from. And um, we also uh, think uh, that it might be sometimes uh, um, consideration to start the adjustment of measures in a smaller or localized geographical area because then the impact would be minimized if uh, the lifting uh, would uh, result in a significant surge of cases. We also suggest that um, between uh, the lifting of one measure and another one there should be a, a sufficient time to um, uh, 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 see the impact. And the evidence uh, suggests uh, from what we see today that uh, the, the impact of adjusting measures may take at least two to four weeks to become apparent in the epidemiological monitoring. Um, when deciding which measures can be lifted first, then um, of course it is uh, more advisable to uh, choose those that are targeted to age groups where the evidence so far shows continued limited disease transmission um, uh, and um, uh, so that the impact would be um, uh, less likely to result in a major public health impact. And so far, it's, uh, may, this may only apply to children that are younger than 10 years of age, although the data are still limited uh, on the role of children in transmission. Um, when adjusting physical distancing measures, then um, uh, there should be measures identified that could be maintained for longer periods. Um, of time with some adjustments and whatever um, measures are modified, um, people in high risk groups, so more likely to have severe clinical outcomes, they must remain protected from infection um, uh, until an effective vaccine or treatment is available. And um, uh, previous speakers have already highlighted that it's the people in the nursing homes, the old people, and also the ones with underlying diseases. So um, 
what should also be considered is the indirect consequences when measures are lifted. Um, uh, because uh, right now, for instance, with the lockdown, uh, public transport uh, uh, station usage is quite low. But if you start opening uh, this lockdown, then it might be increasing. So the effect has to be taken into account um, uh, uh, in, in um, uh, considering which measures to, to lift. I leave it as, he, as, as here uh, um, at that point. And um, for any questions that you have to ask, my uh, colleague Bruno Chancho would be ta uh, taking these because I have to leave now. Thank you. Dr. Ramon, I want to, to thank you. Sorry, my mic was not uh, open because um, I tried to reduce the, uh, the burden to the network. And I want to thank you. It's really important to, to listen to you. It seems that you have a lot of data. 80%, it's really important to understand that we can actually coordinate and learn from uh, the monitoring you have and the mapping of uh, this disease. Um, if I may, before you leave, just I think the question that we all have and I take this opportunity. Do you believe that during the summer um, it will be better? Um, I mean, more uh, less strong uh, to, uh, transmission, uh, the level of transmission. And uh, because I heard that even the air condition could, could uh, uh, transmit it even more. And this means we're, go we're not going to have a touristic period. It means that people will not feel comfortable again uh, for a very long time. And do you think um, it was an exaggeration, the full lockdown, or do you believe this is the only way? If you don't mind, um, I would love to hear your point on that. I mean, the, the, the lockdown has worked uh, not only now in Europe, as I have indicated, we, have, we see that cases are, de uh, are decreasing. Uh, it has also worked in Asia. Uh, so it, it is right now um, uh, a measure that is, uh, having a, um, a positive impact on the number of cases. However, as also has been pointed out, it has also a negative impact on, on the economy. And I mean, um, um, there has to be a, 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 a balance that we have to strike. Um, I mean, of course, from my point of view, as a as a medical doctor, and epidemiologist, I would see the health, public health principle uh, in the forefront. But I also know that health and economy are closely interrelated, and uh, we, you cannot separate it from each other. Uh, and as to the summer, we don't know about the seasonality. We really don't know. Everybody would like to know. Uh, that would be a relief, of course. But uh, uh, we cannot we cannot uh, say anything about this. That's the one thing. And the other thing is um, uh, we are working also on on uh, um, uh, uh, guidance for um, um, potential um, uh, opening of of, of uh, hotels or whatever for summer holidays. Thank you. I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it, it will depend on the on what we see. It's like, uh, as I said, we have yes. to follow all these uncertainties until we have more data if, to, to see if we're uh, making the right decisions. Um, so thank you for, for giving us all this information. Thank and, you very uh, much. We, we will be in touch. Thank you so much. And, and be strong and stay, stay safe. Thank you. I, I will immediately um, move to our next uh, speaker. Um, we have uh, Jean Stefan from Cure Back uh, Clinical State uh, pharma, uh, Bio Pharmaceutical Company that's actually pioneering uh, the field of uh, RNA based drugs. And he has experience from several very big companies, um, companies that they deal with uh, therapeutics, vaccination, and uh, um, I, I do think that his, uh, um, his understanding of how we can expect the treatment, the clinical tests, uh, how long they will take, if we can speed up a bit, and also if he sees that all these um, new treatments that every day we're hearing about have a, a good basis and can we hope 
for a treatment in in 2020 because I understand the vaccine would would take more time. But um, uh, Mr. Stefan, I would love to to give you the floor and and uh, hear uh, your your expertise and your information to to this yes, discussion. Sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Eva, and I will not be too long. I spent all my life at uh, GSK, and I was involved uh, in the production of the pandemic vaccine in 2009-2010, right? And uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I believe that government are right to continue to work on mass diagnostic treatment. Personally, um, I am a little bit surprised that uh, government don't work on early treatment with the hope to reduce transmission. And I know that some study are ongoing, right? But we know that uh, the virus can be detected by PCR during four or five days, not more, after it's go down in the respir respiratory tract. And we should try to influence the, the transmission because diagnostic have limitation and for sure treatment of CDS is, uh, is a major challenge, right? And there is, uh, I hope there will be drug or monoclonal antibody developed to do that, to save these people. But uh, I am uh, like Bill Gates. I believe that the ultimate solution will be a vaccine. And for sure a vaccine will be put on the market for at risk population in function of the epidemiology and with authorities will will always evaluate uh, the risk benefit. Next slide. If you look uh, what is ongoing in vaccine, uh, you have uh, protein and adjuvant, which is the classical vaccine which has been produced during the last 30 years. And uh, for sure, it's a secure technology, which I believe will succeed. But the limitation is the production of large uh, number of doses for the worldwide population. Then you have the lag vector, which is developed by Johnson and Johnson, which is a promising technology that they have tested also for Ebola. And they have knowledge in that and uh, they can produce large quantity. And they just uh, received uh, a few weeks ago $1 billion from Barda in the United States to build a plant at risk. Then you have the DNA vaccine on which I work in my life, but personally, yes, but uh, still uh, a lot of unknown. Then you have the new technology, which is based on uh, mRNA, and uh, you have, let's say, four companies very active on that. Moderna in the US, uh, BioNTech, Translate Bio, and CureVac. And uh, these companies are working since uh, 20 years. You see that Moderna has been financed also from Barda with half a billion dollars. And uh, CureVac. Uh, has worked during 20 years and the last seven years they focus on rabies vaccine and they have been able to show that uh, two, mark, two times one microgram is sufficient to build immunity in rabies with neutralizing antibody. And this is why I believe it's, uh, it's a technology which I believe is a little bit unique. For example, Moderna is testing those from uh, 10 microgram to 200 microgram. Curevac will very likely test those from 1 to 10 microgram, which give you an idea of the capacity of production if you succeed. Then, next slide, when discussing with uh, authorities, uh, what is key, uh, yes, uh, for sure, uh, Curevac and all the mRNA companies have invested a large amount of money in the last 20 years. We are discussing now, starting in June, a study phase 1, 2A, so which is a dose range study, safety study, in more or less 500 subjects, in healthy subject. But what is key is to demonstrate that in elderly, we need the same dose as in young subjects. Generally, the immune system of a person who is older 
is less good than a young person. And perhaps the dose has to be adapted. And that's a critical point in the development. But we are in discussion with the Polar Research Institute and the Belgium Authority because this study will be done in Belgium and in Germany, and we hope to start uh, very soon. We see that the technology induced neutralizing antibody, and if you look what's happening in the field, uh, the analysis of the people who have been naturally infected, it doesn't seem that people generate a lot of neutralizing antibody, but more data will come in the coming weeks. I know big study ongoing in Germany to understand is a person who has been exposed protected or not. And I think it's critical information for the vaccine, right? There is concern for the vaccine about enhancements of disease. It has been discussed with uh, many authorities, right? And uh, FDA in the United States has agreed which protocol we have to follow. But uh, recently, in the last 24 hours, a publication from China of a study in monkeys seems to show that there is no risk of enhancement of disease like, you know, the virus like RSV or measles, which has occurred in the past. Then you see that after you need to do a large study in 16,000, 18,000 subjects. It will be done this, uh, in Europe mainly. So it means it's a large investment and we expect the government, but also European Commission to do like United States to help us in the development of that vaccine. Personally, and with the people that I'm working with, we are convinced that uh, by end of the year, we can have enough data to receive uh, a conditional approval. And this is something we are discussing with authority. And uh, yesterday we were discussing with the Belgium authority. It will be discussed with EMA. But if you look to the population of elderly where, or at risk Irish patients, due to chronic disease, when you see the mortality rate of 15 person, I think vaccine can be a way to protect uh, these people. And clearly also healthcare workers in the, working in the hospital is also at a risk population, but all that will be discussed with the authorities in the coming months. Then what is critical, next slide, what is critical is to build capacity in advance. So it means you need to take the risk. We thank the Commission because uh, a few weeks ago, the capital investment uh, funding of 80 million has been approved by the President of uh, the Open Commission. But the next step will be just to validate that uh, building, validate the process of risk, and it will require something like 120, 130 million euro additional. And we are in discussion with government on that. And we hope to also to have discussion with the European Commission. As Bill Gates have said, you know that Bill Gates have put uh, a few billion dollars to finance at risk uh, seven plant of production in the United States or somewhere in the world. We don't know exactly. He has not disclosed, but he said, I am doing it because I want to save trillion in the economy. Next slide. If you look what are the major inflection points in the development of the vaccine. Next slide. Hello, next slide. It doesn't work. Yeah, oh, thank you. So clearly, this, uh, we are studying the, the immunogenicity of the vaccine in animal, establishing the dose, checking if you induce neutralizing antibody. And for example, I know that in Belgium, uh, two sites will do, will have validated tests for neutralizing antibody. I know that Germany is working on that and uh, public health uh, people are working on that and it's critical for the development of the vaccine. 
Then, as I said, understanding what's happening in infected subject is critical. And we see more and more publication, and I'm sure that week after week, more information will come. Mm -hmm. Then you see that in October, we will get already the result of uh, the 400 uh, subject, which will be involved in the study. And then by December, we should have already a large amount of vaccinated subject, a few thousand, and we will discuss with the authorities conditional approval. For Thank sure, okay. the conditional approval will be a function of the, the risk benefit that the vaccine can bring in function of the epidemiology. Okay, then uh, last slide. Last okay, slide, last slide, because name. it would be great to be able to take also some questions from our, our colleagues. Yeah, okay. Yes. But last slide and then uh, yes. the question. Yes, yes. This, yes. We are ready to produce already from uh, July uh, 2020, and we are in discussion with the government to produce at risk, you see, more or less 42 million euros, which can represent if the dose is low, something like 50 to 80 million doses. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, at least we hope that by the end of the year, we're going to have uh, more data and probably several different treatments. And I, I kept the note what you said, early treatment actually um, seems very important because it takes just four or five days, not 15 days. Um, to detect that um, somebody has been affected. Um, I will leave the floor for questions after we hear uh, Marco Rusiver, uh, Rasver, co-founder of Quanna. So this is um, a centralized platform uh, for uh, funding open research globally. So this means um, our hopes are that globally if we have a platform where we can concentrate ideas and innovative solutions, being able to fund them then uh, we would have a better response. So it's like it's called collective intelligence also. So um, uh, he has okay. been working with the European Commission and several governments. So um, yes, I give you immediately the floor because we, we want time for questions. Thank you. All right. Hey, so um, yes, this is something we've, we've done. As you explained, uh, what Guana as a platform has done, we, we've run uh, a few very successful pilots on research funding. But I think like the most um, efficient use of our platform currently has been that we uh, accidentally kicked off a global movement of hackathons around the world a few uh, one and a half months ago. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that actually gives a pretty nice overview of how this platform can be used for research funding too. But I'd rather focus on this right now because this really changed the world for the better. Um, so one and a half months ago, uh, I got a call from my government, Estonian government, um, asking that, uh, you know, they want to run a hackathon. Hackathon is when a lot of people work together to build rapid solutions to critical problems, just in case anyone hasn't been part of that. Um, uh, it's fine. Uh, neither had I, I had been mentoring, but so, um, so basically what happened was at, t at 10 AM, I got the call. At, um, well, six hours later, we kicked off the first hackathon fully virtual, uh, meaning that we had 1,300 people showing up, starting to build solutions for the for saving, you know, um, lives and the economy from the crisis. Um, and uh, it lasted for 48 hours. After the 48 hours, we ended up with uh, 30 really good solutions. Eight of them are already uh, in use by Estonian government now. Um, the, the, the solutions are, they sound simple in nature, but they are super crucial when it comes to how they're applied. For example, there's a chatbot that understands slang and can talk to uh, you know younger people and the older people the same way, give information. It's been attached now to most of the government websites. It's also been attached to um, some of the media sites, you know, with a higher traffic. It's it, uh, the higher higher solution comes from actually with well, the purpose of it. Actually, why I'm excited about it is that it uh, frees up the hotlines for elderly people who don't know how to use chatbots. So it's basically funneling the 
different kind of, uh, how to say, needs uh, based on, you know, elderly going one way, younger people the other way, and they, you know, all get served. There's no panic. Um, second thing that I really, really loved that came out of it was a uh, work for a sharing platform, uh, meaning that, you know, companies don't have to let people go. Uh, Instead, they can share, uh, like hotels, for example, can share their workforce with the people who uh, who uh, do deliveries, for example. So a lot of this happens. So uh, one of the things that's more relevant to this discussion, for example, is a medically trained volunteer platform that is connected to hospitals. Meaning that if there's a sudden surge of needs uh, of, of experts, uh, to come and help with, with more simple things. For example, someone from a military or retired, someone who's retired from military can come and help uh, because they've been trained to do so. Um, so that that's something that we hope we will never have to use, but it's there. Um, this worked really well because of the public and private sector collaboration, the same way as the open um, research funding that pilots that we did, for example, with the government of Dubai and the uh, Estonian government too. So what happened afterwards was kind of miraculous and, and also weird and also um, something that kind of tied us down for the next one and a half months is that Latvians decided they want to do a hackathon like this too. And then Finnish, and then Norwegians, and then Swedish, and then you know Brazilians, and then Mexico, and <laughs> the whole world really started doing this. So we had to write down our playbook really fast how to do how to run virtual hackathons. As you could see, um, even during this call, we've had uh, quite a lot of technical issues. Uh, we uh, wrote the playbook that has helped over 200,000 people around the world to build solutions together now from their homes, regionally and, and globally. Uh, and that's not uh, Guana. Guana is just one part of that. There's also Zoom, uh, there's also Slack, there's a Cisco who's been really heavily involved that we're using right now. So a lot of these com com you know different tools are being used for the process. Um, so, why all of this worked was the lack of bureaucracy um, that we are kind of used to now. And what we've been doing since uh, since then is that, you know, there's been 54 hackathons kicked off around the world now, um, with, as, as I mentioned, over 200,000 people participating. And that happened in, in one month uh, with insane amount of volunteers and, and sleepless nights. Um, or uh, the, the, where we escalate this thing to was what we call now, what is known now as the global hack um, that has, that had uh, ideas coming in from 98 different countries. There were teams that had never meet, met each other where uh, eight members were all from different countries and nationalities who had never met and just collaborated and built stuff that you know was needed for crisis response, was needed for for um, frontline workers, was also needed for the economy. We had partnerships with the European Commission, uh, United Nations, European Space Agency, New America, uh, even like really cool people from Art Directors Club of Europe. That's basically all the great designers from Europe jumped in and made sure that all these things are usable. Um, but you also like companies like Facebook, Slack, Zoom, and Cisco we already mentioned, who never um, asked for any credit, but they were always there to help us with whatever we needed um, to get the message out and, and to make sure that everything works and they can provide us with you know, the technical and whatever assistance we needed. Uh, not once we were turned away. Um, we also had inspirational and, and otherwise leaders show up, uh, like Ray Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, Gary Kasparov, the, you know, we, we all know Gary, um, futurist Thomas Ermikora, uh, United Nations uh, Development Program Administrator Ashim Steiner um, was, was heavily involved. Uh, Leslie Goh, former CTO of World Bank, Mona Hamdi, uh, Manal Rostrom, astronaut, uh, Samantha Cristofanetti. I'm reading the list and I'm just like, I just have to stop now because there's so many people who jumped in. Uh, 
Also, uh, tech heavyweights from the startup sector, like uh, Bill Tai, Christopher Schroeder, uh, Sam Altman, Steve Ruturvitz from SpaceX and Tex Tesla. We expected to reach around 1 million people. Uh, I was just told before this call that we actually reached 600 million people with the message of cooperation and building solutions together. Um, some of the things that came out of this global hack that we rewarded were autonomous robots for disinfection, uh, meaning that, uh, for example, the hospital rooms where the uh, people with infection have been in can be cleaned by a robot instead of uh, someone going there and risking their lives. Because as we just heard, um, a lot of the infections happen in hospitals. Um, and I highly recommend going to theglobalhack.com uh, www.theglobalhack.com and see the results. There's a lot, a lot of solutions there that you can all use. Um, and yeah, so instead of talking about what my platform does for open research, you can find out out in guana.com. It will be sent to you probably. I just wanted to tell you about this beautiful uh, movement that kicked off one and a half months ago that uh, I think really has changed a lot of lives. Thanks. Well, thank you for that. You know, uh, I understand because I knew some of the names that you mentioned. Um, I, I believe that um, if you have so many intelligent people and talented and innovative getting together and joining forces, I think this is going to be um, a crisis that led us to a huge opportunity. and maybe we can actually use all the tools we have uh, to avoid anything similar to happen, but also actually uh, to be able to deal with more things that uh, we thought they were not of our concern. And suddenly a global uh, pandemic uh, made us understand that we should better work together. So even, even though we are alone at home, we are more together and closer than ever before because we face the same threat. Um, I, there's one thing, one comment I would like to say to the end of this. Uh, Marina Ponte from the United Nations uh, 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 SDG Action Group uh, mentioned in an interview that this is not the time for social distancing, this is time for physical distancing. And we saw that happen in a beautiful way uh, during these hackathons and it, it's still ongoing and it will continue growing. Thanks. That's true. I've been I've been following, retweeting everything that you've been doing. So I want to really thank you for that. And um, I, I I've seen already questions coming up. Um, so unless somebody wants to to take the floor immediately, I will I will start with the first one um, to Professor Jan Nevis and uh, Vines because um, I think what's like always in our mind is if the data that are being collected and as we heard actually 80%, if they are based on common standards, so basically if we have quality of data to make, um, to, to, to take, uh, you know, uh, to take them and make uh, some uh, um, recommendations or to understand what's working, what's not, to be able to see if herd immunity worked or if the treatment for Ebola has worked, um, do we have common standards to be able to compare across uh, the member states um, because it would be really important to understand um, if this is actually the most deadly and transmissible virus, um, if uh, herd immunity worked, if the lockdown worked better, if the treatment of Ebola worked or treatment of malaria, malaria worked. So do we have common standards and any answers to these questions? Professor Ioannidis, I would start with you and, and then uh, Professor Venice. So and unfortunately, much of the data that uh, we have and those that are most visible are, are very unreliable. Uh, in particular, the number of cases is vastly underestimating the true number of infected people. And uh, not only that, but uh, uh, the underestimation is very different across different countries, depending on how many tests they're performing. Um, a country that is performing very limited testing will have very few cases detected. It will seem like it has a, a small problem. Uh, well, actually, it's just not performing enough tests. Uh, so you cannot compare head-to-head -head countries in terms of cases. Um, comparisons for deaths are a little bit uh, probably more reliable, even though there's differences in case definitions, there's differences 
in the extent that people are tracking deaths that are happening at home. And there's also differences in the extent of uh, whether uh, coronavirus is causally related to the deaths. Uh, in Italy, for example, 98.8% of the deaths had uh, other causes for death uh, along with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and it, on average, they had 2.6 other causes for death. So we cannot really uh, just use these data and say this country is doing better, doing worse, uh, let alone to make claims that our lockdown measures uh, have worked. I, I think this is a major misconception. The lockdown measures were clearly indicated when we heard that this is a virus that is killing 3.4% of people who have the infection and uh, that is spreading very widely. And of course, lockdown is, is immediately uh, necessary to do. But the data do not really support that lockdown has helped. And even if it did, um, we don't know which part of lockdown uh, did help, which others had no impact, and which measures within the lockdown package might actually done some harm. So we need to move beyond lockdown because the cost in lives, now that we know that the infection fatality rate from the virus is much, much lower, like 20 or 30 times lower than we thought, the cost in lives from the lockdown is tremendously higher compared to what the virus can do. Unless we move forward to alleviate some of these measures, it would really be a disaster. And I, I'm sure that we cannot do that overnight. It will be gradual. Everyone has been shell-shocked. Everyone knows that this is a serious problem. It's, it's a virus that we haven't met before. We don't have herd immunity. But we need to test measures and to know whether they work or not in relieving these measures we need to have seroprevalence and incidence and very close look at hospital capacity because this is really eventually what matters. If the epidemic gets out of control, we need to have functional healthcare systems to take care of cases and treat them properly. If they don't get proper treatment, this is when we get the very high excess of, uh, of mortality. Um, if I may, because I'm, uh, I'm reading also my colleagues' questions, um, so I understand we, we have unreliable data, but since you, um, you're very familiar with the similar uh, diseases that are being uh, uh, more infectious, I understand, more transmittable, um, I wanted to ask you if, um, if we can measure the error of the testings, the errors of the testing. So you said more tests are, are needed, but do you think this is necessary? So tests do have errors, and we need very careful validation, uh, and multiple teams uh, have been doing validation studies to assess uh, the error rates for false positives and for false negatives uh, for serology tests. We have very good uh, knowledge about uh, the performance of PCR tests. They are very specific, uh, but uh, sometimes they may miss cases, and of course they will not tell you whether you were infected a while ago. Uh, they're just uh, capturing active shedding of virus. I think that Tests, as uh, Professor Vinay said, especially serology tests, they're very good for seroprevalence studies, especially once you have uh, a fair number of people in the population infected. The uh, results are going to be pretty uh, reasonably valid for estimating how many people have been infected. They should not be used as passports. I, I think this will be a, a huge mistake to do these tests to say, oh, you have uh, had the virus and you have antibodies and you're fine now. Um, these are just surrogate markers. They're telling us that you have encountered the virus. Many other people may have encountered the virus and they just don't generate enough antibodies or they generate other types of response that would still be perfectly fine and they will not be infected again for a while. Others may have titers uh, and detectable antibodies, but they may not be enough. So we not, need to be very, very careful about uh, using these tests for individuals, uh, but they can be very helpful for telling us in the population, what is the status of the infection in broad terms? Uh, could we thank you for that? So um, I would like to give the floor to Professor Vinis also, and then uh, a couple of colleagues that would like to ask some questions. Professor, yes. uh, um, I also have the question if, if, if you can understand what happened, not just with Italy, but also with Germany um, and uh, France, let's say, because in, in some cases, the lockdown seems to have worked, in some cases not, unless we, are, we don't get exactly how the lockdown took place. But um, so is it like SARS has been more trans transmittable and, and uh, 
Uh, sometimes the lockdown works or not. Uh, and could you could you give us your understanding on what is the best uh, way to deal with it? Right. <clears throat> um, well, first of all, I think that uh, we need to discuss the quality of the data. I completely agree with uh, with John Ioannidis uh, that, uh, that there is a, a real issue with the quality of the data. For, for example, even comparability of uh, uh, the data uh, across region in Italy is, is an issue because essentially it depends on the uh, number of tests uh, that are performed. For, for example, uh, in the region where I live, uh, the uh, prevalence uh, of infected people is increasing simply because they are uh, using the tests um, more um, um, uh, in a more uh, diffuse way in the nursing homes. They have discovered the, 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 the extreme importance of nursing homes, so they are spreading uh, testing to, to nursing homes. So there is an issue with uh, the comparability of the statistics and quality of the data, and we cannot really um, measure incidence of infection yet uh, at all. And I, I also agree that uh, um, a good indicator, perhaps the best indicator, is a bad uh, occupancy and uh, people in uh, um, intensive uh, therapy. Now, um, there has been, oh well, in Italy we also use, uh, in addition to mortality uh, for COVID, uh, there, there is a special registration uh, for uh, deaths from uh, COVID uh, done by the National Institute of Health, but we also have another system which is totally total mortality uh, in uh, municipalities, uh, which is a, a good uh, way to compare and understand what is happening. Because, for example, we have discovered that in certain towns like Bergamo or Mantova, there is a very high mortality, uh, daily mortality rate. Um, this is mortality day by, by day, and we only have a, a delay of, of one day in uh, notification. So. Uh, we, we discovered that uh, mortality has really increased. Uh, it's not only a problem of uh, classification or misclassification of, of deaths. Um, concerning comparison uh, across countries, uh, there has been a, a lot of discussion about the, the low mortality or case fatality rate uh, in, uh, uh, in Germany. Though uh, Germany is a, is a little different from, from uh, at least from Italy, because uh, People infected were, uh, at least initially, pretty young. Uh, the average age was uh, about 48, and uh, in Italy it, it, it is uh, 65. Um, so uh, for that reason, uh, case fatality rate is, is lower. Um, uh, and, and there are other um, explanations, like uh, the classification of the deaths. Uh, there, there has been a, a, a huge debate about uh, uh, dying with uh, uh, the virus or dying from the virus. Uh, so by and large, uh, uh, what is happening is, uh, uh, I believe, comparable across uh, um, countries. Uh, uh, Germany and Japan are still uh, a, an exception, but uh, you can find uh, explanations at least uh, for, for Germany. Um, so I will, I will try to, to, to ask you some questions that I'm reading on the chat. Um, so I understand that we don't have actually common standards um, for this uh, health data that we're gathering at this point. Um, so uh, it's not very clear, but we, we understand it's transmittable and that uh, some measures are, are working if, you, um, if you're able to, to lock down. Uh, but at the same time, we hear that uh, for the summer, we might have uh, new applications where somebody, you said we shouldn't, but I understand that some people will be tested if they want to travel and they're going to have like a medical uh, passport to be able to do so. And um, do you think like applications with, the, I asked from Lina's question, if I'm not wrong, um, if uh, um, a model more centralized would be better or a decentralized model is better in, uh, in terms of using these kind of applications, or not at all? What do you think? Uh, the, the question is for me. Um, so, Mr. Ioannidis, Professor Ioannidis, and uh, and Lina, whoever wants to, to take the floor, please do so. I would say the one that works. It doesn't matter if it's centralized or decentralized, if it helps with contract tracing, you know. So, contact tracing, 
Do you think it's wor it works? Because if we, we see what's happening in China, so a scary video where everybody had uh, a QR code to access public transportation. If it's, if it's red, you cannot. If it's orange, maybe you cannot. But if it's green, you can. Is the technology and the testing accurate enough in order for these applications to, to really make sense? Okay, yeah, right. Uh, maybe um, you could try to answer, or Paolo, you want to go first? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I will be brief. Uh, um, uh, there, ha there has been a lot of uh, talk in Italy about uh, the app, uh, and uh, it, it has uh, several purposes. Uh, one is what you said, uh, that is, uh, the, the app uh, becomes red uh, if you are infected, uh, and it is used uh, for uh, um, physical distancing. Uh, another application is uh, uh, for uh, telemedicine. I mean, uh, uh, general practitioners can um, be um, uh, made aware of early symptoms uh, and then identify uh, early the, the cases uh, and organize uh, uh, isolation. So uh, there is not a single use of the apps. Um, then whether or not the, the, this can be used or uh, serological tests uh, can be used to give a kind of passport, uh, uh, I'm not Sure, certainly not serological tests. Uh, let me add to that that I, I fully agree that uh, we should not be thinking of passports. I think that they create huge problems. Uh, they are based on a misunderstanding that we know everything about immunity, uh, let alone all the, the social discrimination that they will induce. Um, so there's no science and, and there's also lots of other problems beyond the science. I think that contact tracing uh, makes a tremendous sense in a setting where you have very low levels of infection and you want to really extinguish an epidemic wave. And this is really what happened in Taiwan, for example, which is a city, it's an island, it has a single major airport. It just worked very, very hard to contact trace uh, uh, every single case possible. For an asymptomatic infection, vastly asymptomatic, that is spreading very widely, that in some countries may have infected, like Italy, who knows, maybe 20%, 30% of the population, the contacts of 20 or 30% of the population is the entire population. I mean, it's, it's almost the entire population. So you cannot track the entire population. We need to have these seroprevalent studies to tell us whether it's 10%, 20%, 30%. In some countries, it's maybe less than 2% uh, because uh, very few people have been infected. But it's, uh, it's really not a good idea to say that uh, contact tracing will be our first priority. In countries where we have a large number of infected people, most of the emphasis would fall on protecting the healthcare system, making sure that we have extensive testing of personnel on all staff, nursing homes, you know, draconian measures to make sure that everybody is tested continuously to avoid spreading the infection there. And most of the population will just do fine. We just need to take one step at a time, but they will just do fine. Most people get an infection. They don't even notice that they get an infection. You realize that vaccine studies are asking volunteers to get the infection. And, and this is probably fine because they, they will not probably get any serious or even mild uh, symptoms. Okay. And we have ECDC uh, wanting to take the floor. Oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Very interesting discussion. Very interesting. A few mm -hmm. uh, points. Uh, I slightly disagree on the contact tracing approach. I think it's a tool that in public health always worked very well. And we have seen also the difference uh, at the beginning of this epidemic where countries were more uh, equipped to do contact tracing. They've experienced less severe um, um, wave of the pandemic. Now, it's certainly true that during widespread transmission, uh, this is becomes not, not feasible and then you need to change focus. But as we see that most countries are going down in the number of cases and thinking about lifting some measures, then strengthening contract tracing in that particular phase is definitely a way um, to reduce the level of transmissions. It's not like contact tracing for eliminations, like could have been in another phase, but it's contact tracing for kind of keeping the rate of infection to a level that allows hospitals to cope and allows the elderly and those with risk factors to be uh, protected. And there are several mechanisms that we need to put in place to protect these people. So it's not uh, um, very uh, simple. If you allow the virus to circulate widely in the community, then it becomes 
very difficult to kind of isolate uh, only certain group uh, uh, of the population. Now, if I may, in terms of data comparability, I think there is a lot that we can learn uh, now uh, on the data in the member states, actually also because they're not doing all the same things. Uh, during the de-escalation phase, you will see in our rapid risk assessment that we publish later tonight, we give clear guidance uh, for member states on how to do the monitoring uh, of the pandemic during the de-escalation phase. Because if we do this right, this de-escalation phase will give us an enormous amount of knowledge in terms of which measures work best and which actually needs to be maintained. So if we do this right, maybe if there is a second wave or when we see an increase of cases, we could uh, define a set of measures that are more effective, less intrusive and more sustainable also in the long term. So I would encourage really all countries to do this phase very carefully, strengthen their surveillance systems, use the citizens' um, willingness to contribute to this through this participative reporting, applications, etc. Uh, concerning the application, I saw in the chat some concerns about privacy and confidentiality. And of course, these are very important issues. And for this reason, the European Commission issued the last week guidelines and the toolbox that uh, those that develop applications will have to use to ensure uh, that all these principles are respected. So these guidelines are available online and I really encourage everyone uh, that is planning to use these applications to take into account what are the recommendations from the European Commission on this. Well, um, I agree and uh, I believe that's true and uh, we feel more protected in democracies. Uh, the problem is that some countries uh, might use the, this pandemic to strengthen the, the mass surveillance uh, measures they already apply and maybe more people will be excluded from insurance companies and, and, and uh, health systems and this is what we're worried the most but then um, we have to uh, so that's why we're a bit more I understand skeptical because we want to make sure that this will not turn out to be a political um, it will not have also political consequences um, if I may because I don't see could you my colleagues like um, either ask or like add more questions to the chat because uh, I would ask, uh, nobody talked about um, uh, equipment, that uh, safety equipment, if it helps or not. So I wanted to ask um, if we go between the herd immunity and then um, the lockdown, how about um, wearing masks, self-made masks or scarves? Because I understand that some countries are willing to, to try this for, for, the, um, for the summer. Um, do you believe this would help us to go kind of like back to normal um, until we have a proper treatment? Um, so if you wear a scarf, if you wear gloves, this would allow you to go back into work or use public transportation. Or do you think like even our condition during the summer could make it even more transmittable? So we have to keep going with like um, several lockdowns, release some measures and then go back to lockdowns again until we get the treatment. Um, I think that um, in my government, talking to them, they still don't have the protocols from the doctors that they should follow uh, to remove some measures. Uh, this means we don't have enough data. So I was wondering if you have maybe more access to, to this kind of data. And I'm happy to, to follow today the, uh, the press release of what, what measures work the best. But if you could like share some insight now, it would be uh, very useful. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, what we are going to say is not yet which measures work best. I'm saying that we can learn this in the next uh, weeks and months if we are doing the de-escalation in a logical way, uh, slowly and uh, collecting the right, uh, the right uh, uh, data. Now, the use of masks, uh, you know, there has been quite controversial for, for many two reasons. First, we have seen a lot of cases among healthcare workers, and this means uh, that uh, either uh, equipment, protective equipment was not available uh, at the time or that some issues were there in terms of infection prevention and control in the hospital. So the first priority is to make sure that if there is a shortage of uh, these equipments, healthcare workers are prioritized. Now, mask for the population, um, of course, the mask work as a barrier. 
which means uh, that someone who maybe is asymptomatic uh, and therefore can be infectious if they wear what we call a surgical mask, so not those masks that you see in the hospital, but a barrier mask, a surgical mask, uh, that could in theory reduce the number of uh, um, secondary transmission. And we publish a document on this, which is available on our uh, website. Um, what we say is also that we need to be very careful because it creates the false impression of security to people. So you wear a mask and you feel safe and then you kind of abandon all the other measures. So you can wear a mask if it is available, but at the same time, you need to continue uh, with certain social distancing. It doesn't mean lockdown. It doesn't mean closing everything. Social distancing, if well organized, can be done in safe way without going to the extreme uh, where we are now in many countries. Okay, and then maybe I will ask a last comment from Professor Ioannidis because I think uh, most of our uh, participants um, are uh, engaged to other um, discussions or other events. Um, and then I would have our uh, vice chair to, to close this discussion. Um, just the question in terms of, uh, you know, giving us some hope. Uh, what do you think in the end will happen by 2020? Do you think we're going to... Uh, uh, change our social behavior and or do you believe we can get our psychology of confidence back anytime soon um i would love to hear your opinion on that even if it's not based on accurate data yes thank you so uh just uh starting with the, the mask issue uh the science is very contentious and we have to be uh, aware that there's a concept of uh, uh, efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, masks may have efficiency under ideal circumstances, but it, the way that uh, they are used in the community, very often they become ineffective. You know, people are not using it uh, the way that they are supposed to do. So I'm okay to use them more as a psychological measure for people to build their self-confidence that they're doing something more and uh, they're getting themselves more protected. But to be honest, uh, do they really work? in the real world, we just don't know. I'm very hopeful that uh, we will get over this crisis. Uh, I think that the epidemic waves are, are declining in practically almost all European countries, even in, in uh, most states in the US. I think that uh, things will be much better. Uh, I do worry about the consequences of prolonged lockdown uh, on human lives. Uh, I think that many lives can be lost if we prolong just blind lockdown. We need to move forward. We need to have data feedback from reliable data on what happens as we try to remove some of the measures. It's not that we have won the war yet, but I'm very optimistic that we can win the war on coronavirus. And I, I think that the original modeling that was based on unreliable parameters are, are completely belonging to science fiction now. We're not talking about 50 million people dying like was the original expectation. We're not talking about uh, uh, these astronomical numbers. It's a serious problem. We did our best. We will continue to do our best. We will get over it. At lockdown, for long lockdown, I think that's going to be a disaster. Well, um, I think it was quite optimistic your approach because, yes, indeed, the, the, the numbers are, are not the ones that we were scared we would have. Uh, also, each life that is lost. Uh, uh, even because of this virus is, is um, a huge loss for humanity and it really affected our, our psychology. Um, I want to give the floor now to our vice chair, um, Ivar Siyabs, if he's with us, um, to make the conclusion. Yeah. Thank you all, because we're going to have a, a big series of, of events like that where we're super useful. Yes, thank you very much, Eva, for organizing this whole event. And this was really a privilege to my mind to listen to such a distinguished panel of experts. Which you're driving? Answered... No, I'm not driving. Actually, I'm standing on the on the roadside. But 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 I was really enjoying. And also, thank you for summarizing all the questions. The thing I wanted to men wanted to mention is the fact that. Uh, basically, uh, what we are observing right now in Europe is the fact that countries 
are trying to cope with these very complex situations individually. And of course, we don't have answers to many of those questions well, concerning the herd immunity, for example. You mentioned just the serological tests, also the modeling of how the virus and how the pandemic might get further in terms of what would happen if we open the borders that are right now closed in mo among most European countries. These are the questions that we are, of course, right now trying to answer in an individual way that countries are taking decisions by themselves. What we are needing in the future is, of course, a common European approach to many of those complex issues, starting with uh, purely medical or uh, epidemiological issues and all the way to the social and also cultural issues. The masks were mentioned as a, as a kind of a cultural things that might be introduced in the future in order to make people feel themselves more safe and so on and so forth. So I, I also wanted to thank all the distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you to you, uh, Eva, to all the store administrative staff. This was really a pleasure to participate in that. And I have uh, let's say deeply felt convictions that this is not the last time when we are meeting uh, in this or another format to discuss all those aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you very much. Well, um, I want to thank you all and uh, I want to, to make sure that we will be able to meet again because it has been really um, interesting. I want to thank uh, Lina, Viola, Michel, all, all my colleagues that asked questions and uh, they were the ones also pushing a lot to have uh, this event happening. It was very useful. And uh, Marco, um, uh, Rashiver, uh, Jean Stefan, uh, Professor Paolo Venus and Professor uh, John Ioannidis and Dr. Andrea Monaltos is not with us. I want to thank you really um for um participating and uh spending so much time to listening to our questions and i want to wish you uh, to be safe and stay strong and uh till we we meet again even online until we physically are able to to invite you to brussels and of course as the secretariat for making this extraordinary meeting uh, happening for for the first time actually um in our stoas history Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.